this was Peyton. She was 16 years old, and on the morning of June 9, 2011, she got into her car and drove to cheer practice. She wouldn't make it. According to witnesses, she pulled up to the intersection and came to a full stop, and then she proceeded forward. She didn't see the fully loaded coal truck coming at her at full speed, but it impacted her directly on the driver's side. When the vehicles came to rest, they were actually one. The entire driver's side of her car was completely gone. In fact, the front license plate of the truck was now in contact with the center of her dashboard. Peyton was pinned against the passenger side of the vehicle. Her neck was broken at C1. Her lung had collapsed. Her jaw was fractured. Her pelvis was shattered. Her left leg was broken. And her life was slipping away. Then the first responders arrived. It was a, a group made up of a police officer and a deputy sheriff, volunteer firefighters, and an ambulance crew. They began to form and act as a team, aligned with a clear mission. And that mission was to tend to the injuries of the truck driver. And they had an opportunity to save this girl's life. They began to assess the situation. They realized very quickly that she needed immediate and serious medical attention. They knew that it would take from 30 to 45 minutes to actually extract her from the vehicle, to, to cut her out of the car. And they realized that they didn't have that kind of time. So they began to develop ideas. They began to try to figure out and solve what appeared to be an unsolvable problem. And they realized there was a, a small opening in where the sunroof had been. There was a chance for, for someone to slip inside from, from that position, from that place. The deputy sheriff asked himself the question that he always asks, what is my best and highest role? And he realized that he needed to move, and he moved. He climbed on top of the hood of her car and he found his way into the in interior of her car through the opening in the sunroof. When he was in there, he realized that although Peyton's upper body was, was resting against the passenger door, her feet were caught on the driver's side in a, in a very small opening, about four inches in diameter. He was able to, to attempt to pull and, and realize that that was not going to be successful. In a moment that was inspired, he reached down and pulled on one of her shoelaces and it untied her shoe. He was able to loosen her foot and raise her foot, raise her leg, and do the same with the other shoe, shoelace, foot, leg. He then was able to secure her body so that the other first responders could access get inside the car from the outside, from the windows, secure her head and neck, and ultimately pull her from the vehicle. This act that appeared at first glance to be impossible took them 10 minutes, only 10 minutes, to remove her from the car. Peyton was placed in the hands of the ambulance crew, and the ambulance crew sped away to the hospital. This team worked so quickly, in fact, that they were able to call off the life flight helicopter, saving precious minutes and perhaps Peyton's life. At the scene, not a single first responder thought that this young girl would make it to the hospital alive. In the ambulance, they worked hard. They worked hard to keep her alive. Peyton arrived at the hospital and the doctors assessed her injuries and they knew that they were severe. Because of her broken neck and, and the extensive injuries she had, they made arrangements 
to life flight her to a children's hospital in Cincinnati, some 250 miles away. So they readied Peyton for that flight. They then briefed the parents. The outlook was grim. Peyton may not survive the flight to the children's hospital. She may not survive the surgery. And even if she did, they couldn't guarantee any kind of positive outcome. Peyton was then placed in the hands of a three-member life flight crew. And as a helicopter took off, a surgical team assembled on the ground in Cincinnati. When Peyton arrived, they prepared to conduct a very risky, difficult surgery that would, was expected to take eight hours. They were going to have to reconnect her occipital bone through C3 using two titanium rods and six screws. I share this story with you not because it's about helicopters and, and ambulances. There's something more important here. This story is about human beings working in service to one another in alignment with a shared mission. This story is about leadership. Good news. This is Peyton. Peyton survived her injuries. She survived the surgery. She survived two years of grueling physical therapy. Her lung healed, her bones healed, her jaw healed. She regained the ability to walk, to swallow on her own. Peyton would rejoin her cheer team her junior and senior years in high school. She graduated with her class on time and she is now in college. Peyton is my daughter. And over the course of this entire chain of events, I spent a lot of time reflecting on what had happened. I kept coming back to these first responders who'd performed so magnificently in, in a situation that I think few of us can barely imagine. How had they accomplished what they had accomplished? I found out who they were, and I arranged to meet with them individually and, and collectively. I learned some important things. They had a clear mission focus. And this is a hallmark of, of teams that are well-led and also that lead well, and there is a difference. They were well-led, strong mission focus, training, how they were prepared for their mission. They had the right people there, the right equipment. They knew how to conduct themselves in that kind of a situation. Everything they did, decisions, initiative, was all focused on mission. And in this case, Peyton was the mission. They led well, shared leadership. This was not a situation about position or, or titles with some person with great authority uh, uh, issuing orders and people standing around waiting for instructions. They knew how to move. They knew how to lead in the moment and, and at the scene. They moved as a team. This was not a case where there was, uh, it was about individual effort. Everything they did was in the context of a, of a team. They believed. They had, had the audacity to believe that they could literally change the outcome, that they could save this girl's life. And they moved with that conviction, and it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And finally, they served. This wasn't about uh, their own self-interest. This was about their teammates and Peyton. And everything they did was with that spirit. Not a single first responder asked to be recognized or sought recognition for what they did that day. And when I looked at what the, they had accomplished, I reflected back on, on a prior life and, and my own 
experience as a Marine Corps officer. And in the Marines, we learned that leaders have a sacred responsibility to serve their Marines in accomplishing the mission. Sacred responsibility, service, mission. That was, we used phrases like officers eat last and take care of your Marines first. Those weren't just phrases we threw around. They were the, really the, the hallmark. They were at the heart of how we led. Authentic leaders serve people in accomplishing the mission. You can call it alignment. Can it be that simple? Oh yeah, it can be that simple. We have so confused the concept of leadership. We've made it almost unattainable and, and sort of mystical and magical. It is that simple. It is real, it is human, and it's vital. But it takes this, this important shift in perspective, this, this servant's perspective. And here's what it's, it looks like. Very simple. Mission, mission is at top, big letters. Mission is primary. A compelling mission is a motivating power. It's, it's an aligning force. People bring their, their talents and, and passions and skills in alignment to, to accomplish mission. And the second element, individuals, people, with a unique set of skills and talents. I, I think of the first responders in this case, and their training and their equipment and their focus with a clear alignment with mission. And then the third element, at the bottom, small, humble. That's the servant leader with this sacred responsibility to serve and support people in alignment with mission. That is the correct orientation. See, it, it's not about the leader. That is where the magic happens. That is where the power comes from, not from uh, you and I individually, but from we. I'd like to challenge you to lead as a servant. I'd like for you to, to think about what happened in, in Peyton's case and, and realize that in your life, you can humbly and, and in a meaningful way define yourself as a leader. It will transform and inform you as to how to act in a particular situation. It will change your relationship with people and events. Number two, get on mission. Al align yourself with, with something that has meaning, that resonates with you. And number three, lead. Lead as a servant. Lead is a verb. It requires us to roll up our sleeves and to bring our, our talents and our skills and our experiences to the table in service, in support of others, in alignment with a shared mission. Peyton's accident humbled me deeply. I uh, felt that I had failed her. She'd only been driving for about three weeks. I could have done more. I could have taken her by that intersection one more time and made sure she understood that although she had the stop, the cross traffic did not. I could have done more. I didn't stop the coal truck from hitting her. I, I couldn't pull her from the car. I couldn't fly the helicopter that took her to the children's hospital. And I couldn't do the surgery. In fact, I had to rely on many other volunteers and professionals to do that. It felt that I hadn't done enough. I did not save my daughter. I, I do, though. 
define myself as a servant leader. And I, although I, I felt that I could do nothing more for Peyton, there was more I could do. What is my best and highest role? I could find some way to recognize this entire group of people from first responders to, to caretakers and physical therapists. We could say thank you. My best and highest role became Marines Like Missions. My new mission was to say thank you. So we found ways after Peyton returned from the hospital to, to identify and, and recognize in ways both public and, and private these people who did so much, who actually gave her the chance to live and, and to live a full life. So my best and highest role at that point was to say thank you. It was as simple as that. One of the meetings I had was, it was a great opportunity. Several months after the accident, I arranged to meet with the ambulance crew. We met at their station and I brought some pictures of Peyton and shared them with, her, with, with them and I wanted them to just know a little bit more about her. I wanted them to realize that they did something very important here and I learned about them. We had a, a great discussion and when I felt that I'd said enough, I asked for my leave and I got up to walk away. And one of the young men who was, who was on the team stepped away. And as I'm walking to the door, he said, sir, sir. Then I turned around and yes, uh, I'd, I'd like to give you something. I said, certainly. And he held out this emergency rescue knife and he said, I'd like you to have this. And I said, w what is that? And he said, this is the knife I had on, on that morning and I used it to knock the glass out of the windows so that we could get to your daughter and pull her from the car. He said, when I got back to my room after we were finished at the accident scene, I put it in the drawer beside my bed and it's been there ever since. I haven't been able to bring myself to, to pull it out. But when I met you today, I realized I needed to give it to you. And I said, thank you. Your final lesson as a servant leader is to say thank you. Thank you.